Hi, so thank you for joining us today. Um, of course. So I've scribbled some notes that I meticulously made while annotating the book. Um, but first, the first thing I wanted to ask is, so you were the founder, this was your baby, this Nasty Gal was your company for years. Um, how did the idea of writing a book come about? I mean, was that something you've always wanted to do? Is that something, you know, somebody else had the idea for? And Hi. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. So, you know, part of my story is, has a lot to do with social media. A lot of my story has a lot to do with social media. And um, on my personal social media, which I didn't really have until, at least publicly, until Instagram really came around, uh, I was getting uh, a lot of comments that were like, I want to do what you did. I want to work for you. How did you do it? Like, you know, I have an eBay store. Like, I want to, you know, I want to learn from like what you've done, whatever. And so, like everything I've done with Nasty Gal, you know, social media, a lot of it is about listening. And I, it was very serendipitous. So I moved to LA. I bought a house, so that was cool. And I needed an attorney, and the only attorney I'd really had was someone who worked on like my will, which is a kind of depressing thing to do in your twenties. Um, and so I needed someone that was like a general attorney that could deal with contractors and an architect or whatever. I was going to remodel this place. And I got introduced to someone who was like an, I didn't know at the time, they were an entertainment attorney. And so I had a meeting with him. He was like, listen, I can deal with contracts for like your, you know, whatever plumber. But what else do you want to do? Like, do you want a TV show? Do you want to, like, what do you want to do? Like, what you're, you know, Nasty Gal's amazing. Like, you could do so much, so much with this. And... I, I was like, I don't know, a book seems really cool, but, I, you know, I don't know. And then he said, cool, I'll introduce you to the head of the literary department at WME. I can't make anything happen for you, but all I can do is, you know, make the introduction, and if something happens, then great. And he did, um, and had a meeting with someone who works for her, who has, is now kind of like my fairy godmother at, at WME. Um, and we had one meeting, and she said, what would you want to do? The obvious thing would be to be, a, you know, to do a style book, a hardcover coffee table book. And I was like, ah, I don't know. I mean, that's so expected. And it's not because I wanted to do something unexpected. It was just because, like, um, a business book would be really fun. And, if, you know, there's a lot of stuff, stories that I hadn't told about my experience to reporters in the media because, like, what am I going to do? Tell Forbes that I was a dumpster driver? Like, what's the headline going to be, you know? Um, so it was cool to tell my own story. And I also... You know, I really kind of set out to write a book that was in some way like the gateway drug to the business section of the bookstore for someone who may not be going there yet because um, I was I was that girl. Um, and I think there's a lot to learn in that part of the bookstore. So. <laughs> so that's interesting that you say that that's sort of the gateway drug to like a book about business or management because when you see the cover, it doesn't look like a book about business, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's girl boss. I mean, yeah, it has the word boss in it. But um, what sort of what made you pick that title? At what point did you pick that title? What does it mean for you? And also, how would you differentiate a hashtag girl boss from a nasty gal? Mm -hmm. Like if both have a persona, are they totally. the same or are they different? Good questions. Um, so, you know, I named Nasty Gal after an album and a song by a lady named Betty Davis. And I don't know, just in that same vein, I just, it's, I guess I don't, Really, I'm not inventing names. So there's a, there's a film, a very little known film called Girl Boss Gorilla, uh, from the 70s. That's like a Japanese uh, female revenge flick, and it's really stylish, really good. It's like a girl gang, t girl gangs like knife fighting in the streets, like s just so cool. And they all have like a tattoo over their like right boob or something. Um, so it was called Girl Boss Gorilla, and I just I loved the name, and I was just like. Girl boss. I don't know. It was never called anything else. There were no alternate names. It was just kind of like it was really simple. And then you know, how do you, how do you differentiate a girl boss from a nasty gal? I think nasty gal dresses girls to f feel like they can live the life that they want and achieve what they want. And girl boss gives them hopefully the tools to do it. So I would say the ethos is very similar. Nasty gals a fashion brand, 
uh, first and foremost. And I think Girl Boss right now right now is a book. Come on a podcast. This isn't working. Um, do you want to switch? Okay. Hello. Hello. Um, but I think Girl Boss has the potential to be a lot more. Um, yeah. I mean, you have a foundation now and everything, right? Yeah. Tell us a little more about that. Yeah, so we launched the Girl Boss Foundation about a year ago, um, and you know, I just really wanted to do something to give back to girls who were, you know, starting their own businesses and uh, and specifically creative entrepreneurs. I think because it was my f experience with photography um, that got me kind of like, oh, you, you know, that was really fun about having an online shop was the photography, and it still is today, even though I'm not taking the pictures. Um, so to date, we've given away $75,000 in grants uh, to girls in like art, music, fashion, design. One girl makes these really beautiful silk scarves um, and use the grant to uh, get into like, you know, rent some space at a showroom and to make samples of silk pajamas using the same kind of illustrations that she prints onto her scarves and they're really, really beautiful. Um, there's another grant recipient who uh, publishes novellas, so short form books. Um, her company is called Novella and she's really awesome. So it's, um, it's the start of, to something that I think will become a bigger way that Girl Boss can tell other people's stories other than my own uh, because I think even hearing their stories gives other people uh, perspective and confidence and um, yeah. I mean, I think that's the biggest appeal of your book, and it was for me. It certainly was very inspiring for me when I read the hardback um, uh, maybe a year Thanks. ago. And um, I think what's interesting is the whole trajectory from, you know, quote unquote, dumpster diving, free again, um, sort of like interested in anarchy and sort of going from job to job. And then, and then bam, you're a CEO and you have this multi-million dollar company and you're this big success story and everybody thinks it's an overnight success. Mm -hmm. But that journey was definitely not an it's, immediate one. It's been almost nine years since I started selling stuff on eBay. I guess, right. So. And so what I'm curious about is, was there a moment that showed you, that demonstrated that you had sort of quote unquote made it? Was there a moment where you were like, wow, this is much bigger than I ever thought it would be? Yeah. Absolutely. I definitely, I don't ever use the term I've made it. And I get that a lot. Like, when did you know you'd made it or making it? I think it's just like, that's an everyday thing. Cause if I thought I'd made it, I'd probably look like the wrong way and get hit by a bus or something. I'd be like, woohoo. You know, like <laughs> don't turn your back to the ocean. <laughs> um, but I, there was, you know, there was a time it, and there's different moments over the course of you know, Nasty Gal's trajectory, I think, that were symbols of that and other symbols of, like, holy shit, like, this this could all fall apart, you know? Um, but I think it was, the first one was when I was in L.A., like, shopping for vintage and, you know, visiting friends, drinking canned beer in someone's, you know, backyard. And my auctions were closing, which is just so cool. You get all these emails and the auctions go crazy at the last minute because people think they're going to, like, sneak in and like get a great deal, but they actually just like drive the prices up because just all it takes is two people that are willing to spend a hundred dollars more, and you're like, whoa! Like it went up a hundred dollars in the last like three seconds. So I think it was when you know, oh God, it was probably 2007. I mean, I was only on eBay for like a year and a half. Uh, that I, you know, my auctions were closing, and it was one week's worth of auctions, and it was like twenty five hundred dollars uh, of stuff, which I'm probably paid like who knows in total, you know, hundred dollars for, who, who knows like what my total cost was. But it was just like, wow, I'm drinking a beer with friends and I just made $2,500. You know, I'd I don't even know if I'd ever made that in a month at a job at that point in my life. So that was pretty exciting. Yeah. It's almost like it's so surreal because it's an ordinary moment where you're drinking beer instead of this big glitzy moment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so many exciting moments happen on our phones now, I guess. And that was that. That was the case for me. So tell us more about um, your current role. So y you were the CEO. Now you are the executive chairman. Mm -hmm. You are, of course, always the founder and sort of the you carry and embody so much of the brand to so many people who admire the brand. Um, but what what what's your current role? How has that evolved? And and do you still have 
you know, as much creative input as you did in the choices and in mm -hmm. the direction the brand is moving. Yeah. So, you know, it's like when you found a company, you're also the CEO. I mean, I was a CEO of a one-person company at one point, technically. I was also, at, you know, as soon as it, we incorporated on legal Zoom, I guess I was the in executive chair or the president and the secretary and all of those things. And, you know, CEO was never a title that I was like, oh, I can't, you know, I'm going to start an eBay store. I can't wait to have the CEO title and have people call me that. Like, it just doesn't really matter to me because what I've built is what matters. Um, what I get to do every day matters. Um, but, uh, so I'm the, I'm, I've always been the executive chairman. I'm still the executive chairman. What does that mean? I mean, I own most of the company. Technically, I control the company, and um, I have as much creative as input as I want. One thing we're spending a lot of time on right now is creating tools for our creative team, for anyone that touches the brand, to understand what the brand is, to know how to use the brand, what the parameters are, where you can play. But over the course of the last, I mean, since you know, I've had a team that are making decisions on Nasty Gal's behalf, whether it's writing email copy, social media copy, taking a photo for social media, or taking a photo that's going to go on the home page, all of those things have to go through some sort of brand filter. And when you, when all you have is conversations about that, one, you find yourself having the same conversation over and over, and two, it feels like a personal thing. So it feels like my opinion versus your opinion or someone's opinion versus someone else's opinion about what's right for the brand rather than this is what it is, it lives here, let me self-reflect before anyone, you know, it, a tool basically. So it makes things less, uh, like more objective. Um, and that's something we're doing a lot of work on is getting this kind of like brand Bible, I guess, to get out of my head things that make Nasty Gal tick so that other people can do a great job and aren't getting emails from me at midnight being like, what is this insane copy? Like, what does this even mean? You know, I, I don't send emails like that sound exactly like that. But, <laughs> you know, but it's like there's a lot of when, when a, a company becomes sizable and the brand, you know, I think if, if our brand was more focused, if we had like a singular product, if we were Blue Bottle Coffee, keeping the brand like in line would be simpler. I'm not saying it would, it's easy or it's easy for them. We have so many products that we write so much copy for. We take so many pictures and send out so many email blasts and post on social media so often that the vo it's almost like the volume is hard, but also Nasty Gal has a very specific voice, which isn't as easy to nail as the voice of maybe some, some other brands. So, Do you feel like there have ever been moments where you felt pressured? Uh, you're right. Not working. Do you feel like you're Hello. Hello. Okay. Do you feel like there have ever been moments where, um, I'll turn this one off, where you felt that there was some pressure on Nasty Gal to conform to whatever was the sexiest sort of mass market trend at the time, and then you might have, um, have there been any moments where you took a direction that didn't fa feel like it was faithful to the actual brand? Yes, um, but I would say our intent and the execution. So in intent, no. Um, in execution, yes. So when there's a lot of different people fulfilling the task at hand, you know, we have something internally that we call fuggery, which is kind of like f the word fuck and luxury together. <laughs> and it's like, you know, it's almost like another word for aspirational or uh, any word you could think of, but it's kind of like our product architecture. We just use it to refer to something internally. But it's because it sounds like luxury, you know, at a certain point, and we had we had a fair amount of turnover in this period in merchandising, so there's that. So there's the people that uh, did know, and then there's the people who are new and still trying to figure it out, and you never really know who's placing, who placed the order for whatever it is. But the last year or so, there's been a fair amount of um, pricey stuff coming through, beautiful stuff, um, but I think, you know, we want to have quality product and to really stand behind that. Our price should migrate a teeny bit, like a little bit, um, but I think it migrated, I think, faster than we had anticipated, and that's something that takes, I mean, the lead time's long, reacting takes time, so that's, you know, and that affects your business, and that's, that's definitely, it, you know, I don't want to turn off the girl who's looking for a, you know, fifty-eight, sixty-eight dollar dress. We have to have something for her, and there's been moments in the last year where that it looks like that 
like we're we're like over her or something, which is not the case, you know. So. So, let's take it back to the earlier days, um, around the time you started the eBay store. Right before that, um, you had a lot of jobs, and you detail those in the books, uh, in the book, and you worked at. You know, you worked at the art school, checking IDs, and and you worked at Subway, um, and all these different things. And then and then Nasty Gal happened, um, and it stuck. Um, so, one thing I am curious about is, do you have sort of like a a, a system, um, a way that you know now after having been through all those choices, um, of of knowing when to quit? And when to keep grinding or keep hustling, um, how do you make that decision about, about, you know, anything big about Nasty Gal or otherwise? It's tough because you know a lot of I've worked really hard, but a lot of what's worked for me has also been somewhat of a path of least resistance model, and that can work when you're doing everything, or when you know when you're when the future is wide open or when you don't have a team that needs a strategy that <laughs> is looking to you for leadership. So, um, you know, to operate a company like Nasty Gal today, that, that just doesn't really work. There are opportunities within that that, that you know, that pop up. But um, that's a tough one. I think I'm, I'm loyal to what I've built, so I want to see it through. Um, I'm loyal to the people who work for me um, and the girl who's been shopping at Nasty Yell because that's the only reason like I have a life um, and a home and some poodles and whatever. Um, so as much as I can, you know, I, I, I'll do right by all of those people, but that's, it's a lot of different groups. Um, and there's a feeling of, I guess, social debt that I have kind of endlessly where I can never be all the places I wish I was or with all the people I wish I could spend time with because I know they would like my time or my feedback or my input. Um, and that's a challenging thing. I think I'm kind of rambling now. I want to answer your question. Um, there was a point, and this was you know before I chose to step up <laughs> into the, I guess, out of the CEO role, where my job became just meeting after meeting after meeting, and it, there wasn't a lot of creativity. And today, um, you know, I'm bringing really great collaborations into the business, or you know, spending time on on things like this brand book and other things that are will give the company kind of like legs for the future, but don't make me just kind of want to bang my head against a wall because. There's people that are a lot more skilled and experienced than I am at getting grown-ups with a ton of work experience to do what they say they're going to do um, and like not give you excuses for why it didn't. It's just like I don't want to tell someone that they're lying if they say that this, this snafu happened and that's why it didn't get done on time. Like I'm not going to – whatever, I'm just kind of – I'm just really babbling now. But <laughs> it's just like – I don't know, you know, it's like the tough versus nurture, like you n need to nurture people for them to be better, for them to know what the task at hand is. There's like such an art to leadership and it's gonna take me a really long time to learn. And that was one thing that I knew the learning curve was just way too high for me on and there were things that I'm way better at. So I think when you feel like, when you wake up in the morning and you're not having fun, that's probably time to change some something, you know? So, I guess, a heurist, heuristic. <laughs> I don't know if I'm pronouncing that. Heuristic, heuristic. Um, so, you talk about exalting the details and how that was a big part of how, of the success of the early eBay store. Um, you would take the pictures and make sure the silhouettes were right. You would make sure the descriptions were, um, you know, evocative. and. It, it just seems like you tirelessly put all this work into making every single listing fantastic. Now, when a company grows to over 400 people, to hundreds of millions in revenue, um, and when you're, uh, you know, not talking to the customer directly all the time like you used to, or, or seeing those orders and 
MySpace comments come in? How do you how do you make sure that those details are still exalted? What do you do to maintain that kind of a culture and that kind of attention to detail? I think that's really hard, and I think that's something we're still figuring out um, because that has to become systematic at a certain point. It starts with hiring people who care, who take pride in what they do, um, who are open to feedback and want to learn, and who, you know, want to tweak out on their work rather than show up and just like, okay, put the jacket on the model. What time is I'm leaving now? You know, um, but like I, this, the brand work that we're doing, like having tools for people to like understand what what a successful um, subject line in email is versus uh, call to action. I mean, we don't have it's not as drilled down as that yet, but I think ultimately you can you have to really define what success looks like for people for them to be. Uh, successful in fulfilling on the brand's promise. And some companies do it better than others. Uh, and I, th I would say it's a work in progress for us. So it seems like when you started out, a lot of things were sort of based on instinct or gut. You kind of just paid attention to the customer. You listened to what she wanted. You made sure to pay attention to every detail. Um, there were also, I'm guessing, a lot of things that didn't come so naturally, like with you know learning how to be a leader of hundreds of people. Um, so looking back, what would you tell 22-year-old Sophia, who's just started this store, and you have no idea that it's beco gonna become what it has become? Um, what would you tell her to sort of, yeah, I mean, what, what lessons would you give her? I would say focus. So I think there's, I think I enjoy having a lot of ideas, but when you have a business plan, which I never did, um, it you, it forces you to say, okay, this is what we're here to do. And I'm the kind of person that's like, oh my God, opportunity, cool. The book was successful, now what? What am I gonna do with, you know, what am I gonna do with Girl Boss? Like there's more people coming out for a paperback than there was when the book originally, you know, was published. So that means something, so cool. Is it a conference? I don't know. <laughs> so that's like, that's just what I do. But when you have a team that's trying to just like accomplish the task at hand, it's like, it, it's not super helpful. It's uh, probably distracting. Uh, so it's, I don't know, it's something that, I don't know, it's focus, focus, no, and then, yeah, just have that, what, what's the center of the universe, you know, for Nasty Gal, it's like, we could become a content business, we could, we could do all these things that will probably, you know, it's like just getting the, the, the job done that we have today is, is a challenge enough, so. Okay. So apparently, it's time for Q and A. Um, does anybody in the audience have a question? We have a mic to pass around. Sasha Arianto. I'll abuse my power to ask a question. I don't know if this even works. Did okay. you turn it on? Yeah. It is working. Okay. Cool. Uh, I think you're so cool, and I've worn so many nasty girl outfits to really important life events. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of us are probably hoping one day to start our own companies or be in that um, early stage process of a company. And it's like when you were in the early days, it seems like so important to make sure you're working with the right people. How did you know who was gonna come to work and be excited or who was gonna come up, come to work and just like wanna look cool and then like peace out early? And do you have any advice with like working with friends? Like yes, or like keep your friends close but work with just professionals? Um, I think you know pretty quickly if someone's going to show up and do more than what, you know, the job description, or at least at the bare minimum, the job description, um, or if they just, you know, want to look cool. I don't know. The, in the people around them, once you accept that, the people around them will think that that's the standard, so you kind of have to cut cut that out pretty quickly if that's the case. But in terms of, like, uh, assessing that before you hire someone, I mean, asking them for ideas. Like, if you don't have ideas, then you're probably not gonna go beyond whatever you're told to do, and it makes more work for the people around you or th for that kind of person when they're like, I'm done doing what you told me to do, now what? And you're like, 
oh my God, there's so many things to do. I, I don't know. Does that make sense? And then, what was the second question? Like choosing to work with friends. Oh, friends. It should just be like only work relationships. I I would say keep your friends, your friends, and your and your team, your team. I I mean maybe I don't have a co-founder. It seems really cool because you can have like pe one person doing PR and the other person running the company or whatever. Um, but in terms of hiring your friends, it's tough. For, I've told myself that, you know, for the friends that have worked at Nasty Gal, I will work with them. It's been more successful when they report to someone who reports to me or reports to someone who reports to someone who reports to me so that I'm not negotiating their future with them. Um, but there's, even when that is the case, there's still awkward moments. And when your friend tells you that they're stressed out, you're like, you take it, I'm like, I'm like, oh no. It's just like more personal because you care about their well. I mean, I care about everyone in my company's well-being. They're probably just not going to be like, "Oh my God, I've been," you know. I don't. <laughs> does that make sense? Yeah. There's just it's a different conversation when you go to dinner with a friend who doesn't work for you, and it's so much nicer, I think, to keep it that way sometimes. Um. Anyone else? You can just say, ask the question. Um, that doesn't happen as much anymore. It, it used to happen. Um, I think, I, I mean, I think a certain amount of humility is good. It's just like, okay, I get it, you know. But, I don't know, I'd, going out of your way to prove that you're smart or belong is kind of awkward. Often it's just being like cool and and curious and if someone doesn't know why you're standing in front of them and you think they should. I mean, the art of conversation is kind of like a lubricant for getting to maybe the more important things or talking about what you want to talk about and uh, and also if, I don't know, people love to be asked for advice. So if it's someone who um, is in like a position of power, I don't know, those people often, I don't know, a lot of people aren't ballsy enough to to just say like, hey, like, I know you did this, I have, I have a question. And it's really flattering for those people and it also gives them a break from themselves, which is kind of a gift. Um, but I would say just act as if. You know, it's like if you don't belong in the room because you're the only girl in the room or if someone doesn't take you seriously because they've never heard of your company or whatever it is, it doesn't mean run around acting cocky. It's just like if you see yourself as the person that is not that thing, that's probably what you'll project. That's like what the world will see you as, I think. So just kind of like there's a little bit of like a whateverness that you just kind of have to keep close, if that makes any sense. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> totally. Mm -hmm. So the question is, for the video camera, what's different about my journey because I'm a woman? Um, I named the book Girl Boss. What's happened? What's transpired in my life because I'm a woman? I think. Like, why wasn't I called Good Entrepreneur? Good Entrepreneur? Would that be a good book name? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, there's a. Okay, I'm going to like adjust my skirt because it's like way too short to be sitting. I'm going to kind of lean. There we go. Maybe. Um, what's different? Nothing, really. Um, I think a book called Boss probably wouldn't have sold as well. Um, and I think it's a cool sounding hashtag. And you know, the book isn't really about being a girl at all. Have you read the book? It's this, I really don't talk about being a girl almost at all in the book. Um, but I think there's a lot of girls that need someone that's familiar uh, to, to, to hear their stories. 
I think it's just, it's like pre-digests the lessons in a way that, you know, when we style something on a model, when she looks like she's going somewhere and she has a handbag and she has a certain attitude and she doesn't just look like a stale person, you can see yourself in those clothes. So um, I think we all um, learn a little better when things are put in context for us. And I think that's what Girl Boss has done for a lot of girls who want to be entrepreneurs or who want to who want to, or just want a voice from someone who had no more uh, money than they probably do if they can afford the book when they started their business. There's a lot of women talking to women who have really great educations um, and really great platforms. Um, but a lot of women talking to women stuff, I think is really stale looking. It just f feels a little, it's just like really serious. And it's also can be very expensive to attend some of these like conferences and stuff. It's like 6,500 bucks to go talk about like being women or, you know, which is cool. That's great for a certain kind of woman, but then there's the rest of us. And I think that's why Girl Boss really resonated. But as far as my career becoming what it is because I'm a woman, I think I've been celebrated more because I'm a woman for sure. I'm going to do with that what I can because that's what I do. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I think maybe because I wear, wore vintage clothing, I wasn't like a fashion freak or anything, but I wore vintage clothing and, um, the brand is for girls and I think I get them because maybe I am a girl and that would be the only advantage, uh, you know, other than having a laptop and a digital camera and living in California and all these other things, but. Yeah, so it's a, her question is about personal style and um, how do I stay true to my style? And I think my styles my styles changed with along with Nasty Gal. There's a lot of stuff that I haven't worn that Nasty Gal that we've you know that we've curated. But I would say you know I've always been wearing leather jackets. I've always been wearing black boots. You know my hair got short and my hair got kind of long. But um, it's how you carry yourself. So w someone could wear the same outfit and look. And, and you wouldn't even really like recognize that it's the same outfit sometimes. It's just, I think it's more about who you show up as than what you wear. Um, but let's see, what's changed? I like to say that LA gave me legs in more ways than one. So when I lived in San Francisco in, in the East Bay, it was just like pants all the time. You wear a skirt, it blows up over your head. You have bangs, they blow back, you know, past your, you know, give you a big forehead and, um, <laughs> And then you move to LA and it's, you know, the weather's amazing all the time and the sun's beating through your window and you can't go outside in like polyester high-waisted pants. It's just disgusting. It's like, it's like a UTI waiting to happen or something. So, um, so that's cool. But it also, for if you're going to wear something short, like it forces you to exercise too. So then it's like this kind of like domino effect of like positive benefits to, you know, wearing a skirt instead of pants, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, yeah. Oh my god, if you no, that's really interesting. So the question's about like the tr you know tra tracing the tr the girl boss hashtag, on in mostly on Instagram is where I look, um, and it's kind of been it's run off with itself. It's like become a part of the lexicon. So there's like Beachbody, which is like a company, has like girl boss things that they do. My dad's like, I know someone who's will you talk at their thing? I'm like, what is this? It's, he's like, they call it girl boss. <laughs> it's like, whatever. I need to get a tr trademark attorney on this. Um, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to turn people off and be like, no, you can't make a coffee mug with Girl Boss on it. But um, the hashtag Girl Boss has like twice as many impressions on Instagram as um, the uh, Nasty Gal, which is crazy. And the books, you know, it's Nasty Gal's nine years old uh, in a commercial. And yeah, you know, it's like not a book. So it's really interesting. But there's like, there's, everyone interprets it a little differently. 
why can I not find, okay, sorry. Um, you're right there. <laughs> Just like, <laughs> um, everyone interprets it, interprets it a little differently. So you'll see stuff like a quote from my book next to a quote that like I really disagree with. Like someone took a picture of me sneaking out of like the Instagram, the, the like square thing. It was a photo I posted because we were in New York at their headquarters. And then they put copy over that said like, um, when you lurk your man's Instagram to make sure he's still like miserable or something like that. And it was just like, whoa, like, you know, just like people just like the whole empowerment thing, like people just like run away with and it just means like, I'm a bitch. <laughs> just like, no, <laughs> that's not the idea here. But it's pretty funny. It's cool. And if it makes anyone feel a little more confident when they leave the house in the morning, I, it's, I'm super happy about it. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you look really familiar? Brittany? Oh my god, hi, how are you? This is Brittany. She was one of our first interns ever in uh, Berkeley. Yeah. You work here now? That's so cool. Congratulations. That's so cool. You look different. You look like, yeah. Did you have braces then? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. You just look, you look a little different. And there's light to come behind your head. Um, What's the podcast? Uh, it's on, you can subscribe to it on iTunes um, and other places. I'm not really sure how distribution works, but Slate, um, it's in partnership with Slate and Panoply, which is their like podcast thing. Uh, and it's going to be like a weekly podcast where I interview really cool women. We're recording with, what? Oh, your face, sorry. I thought I said something weird. <laughs> um, this is Krista. Um, I'm just going to interview really cool women and hopefully have like funny, fun, inspiring conversations that aren't super dry about, you know, their life. Okay, motherhood, let's talk about that. Okay, you know, are you an entrepreneur and an actor or um, a musician? Like how, like how does that work? What's, you know, what do you have to wake up and do every day that you absolutely hate doing? Because there's people, you know, or ask a celebrity, like, do you use public restrooms? You know, I'm really excited <laughs> about that one. Um, yeah, it's just going to be hopefully fun and educational and, yeah. Go Boss Radio. Hi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brands I look up to. I mean, I think Google's pretty awesome. Um, I feel like I should just stand in this skirt. Um, Google. Blue Bottle is one. Um, I think, you know, Luxury does it really well. Like, I really love Dior. Um, <laughs> what else? Um, I mean, companies like Red Bull that have turned their, their brand into a symbol of, like, a lifestyle beyond, like, a drink. Like, that's amazing. That's really kind of, like, transformational, you know, to, to turn a really simple product into something that resemble like that, that that means something much greater. Um, so any brand that's doing that, I would say, yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So the Girl Boss Foundation, the question is, the Girl Boss Foundation, what's what's going to happen? Do, are you just giving grants away? Are you helping people too? Because, you know, you blow through money and maybe you learn nothing that happens. Ideally, yes. Right now, no one works for the Girl Boss Foundation, so it's really, it's pretty kind of bare bones in terms of the operation of it. Long term, absolutely. And, you know, even just giving these girls a platform. So we had an event in Santa Monica at our store with one of the grant recipients, Novella, uh, Dina Drewis, who does Novella Books. And she, you know, was in front of, like, I don't know, a couple hundred girls being interviewed by the uh, West Coast editor of Vanity Fair, which is just something that wouldn't happen otherwise. 
Um, so I think exposure is that part's easy because we can like tag team that in some ways. But I do think mentorship is really important and long term. I think that will be a part of it. We need to assemble like maybe a board of advisors or um, and who knows? It could be could be a venture fund. Like I have no idea. I just get excited about ideas. So. Mm -hmm. So what have we learned from the physical stores? Um, we learn, we get real-time feedback on the products, like this thing's falling apart, or this zipper is just the factory, you know, we don't, we can't inspect, we don't, we can, some people do, it's very expensive to inspect every single thing. Um, so there's things that come out in the process of people trying stuff on, or this runs large or small, or people are loving this, or um, I think it, allows us to see opportunities a little sooner. Um, I mean, we're learning that our, that our girl like loves to shop in person. Um, she loves to shop online, but uh, there's a level of service, I think, in our stores that I'm really proud of. Uh, that's on like a higher level. I mean, you, you can't go into an Urban Outfitters and have someone do much more than kind of like roll their eyes at you. <laughs> um, so I'm really proud that we, we have friendly girls who engage, who, like are there yeah they're like hi how are you they're not gonna they're not like you know hounding you but i do think that at our price point it's hard to find like i don't know a boutique experience and that's that's melrose especially is like that what else are we learning from our retail stores that we want more of them that'll take time um i think that's it for now yeah cool Thank you so much for coming. Um, let's give her a round of applause.